What's going on everyone? Cameron here with Exodus and in today's video we are covering what you need to be doing right now for next year's season. We're talking to Don Higgins, John Eberhardt, and Bo Martonic, all guys that really prioritize postseason scouting and getting your work done in the postseason. So let's get right into it. Let's say postseason, postseason. Let's say January, February, March. I'll go to all of my old locations, clean them up. If I got new property or if I want to prep a couple new locations on some property that I was hunting last fall and I'm like, you know, I need to put a stand over there. That's when I prep everything. All my all my location preparation and all my scouting is done by the end of April. I don't do anything in the summer. I don't do anything preseason. So I may have 40 trees prepped by the end of April or cleaned up my old ones. I've got that many that I've visited and they're ready to hunt. And then what I'll do is just before season, uh, and again, our season opens October 1st. Sometime after September 20th, I will visit my locations, especially the ones that are set up next to food, like apple trees, white oaks, uh, red oaks, uh, stuff like that. I'll take a speed tour. I call it a speed tour. I don't call it preseason scouting. I call it a speed tour. And I'll wear my scent lock. I'll be as scent free as possible. And I'll just visit all my early season locations to see if they're going to be dropping master fruit. So when I have an app, if I have six or seven locations set up at apple trees and five or six set up at white oaks, I have no clue if they're going to be bearing master fruit. So I have to take a speed tour to check out to see if they are going to actually produce food. And uh, the reason I do that after September 20th is if they are dropping food, then there will be buck activity at it because all the bucks are rubbed out by then. All the bigger bucks. Big bucks are typically rubbed out by September 5th. So there's going to be rubs, and typically at apple trees, there's going to be scrapes. So that speed tour will dictate which trees I hunt during the early season. Now, there has been years where I haven't had any mass. Like last year, there wasn't any apples or any white oak acorns on any of my locations. So, you know, I, I hunted in bedding areas. You know, I went in a couple hours for daylight opening day and hunted in a bedding area. Gotcha. So when you go hunt these bedding areas... Mm -hmm. How are you, I mean, you're still set up before, way before season April. Yes, they're and totally prepped by, in it, no later than the end of April. Now is that, how are you identifying those? Is that based off of witnessed accounts that you've seen in seasons past? Is that based off of postseason scouting? Well, well, I can identify a bedding area pretty easy. It's just going to be the densest property on the, the densest area in the property or in the area of the vicinity. Yeah. And how do you so, identify that though, as a doe bedding area versus a buck bedding area? I mean, do you have the, that, that typically if it's going to be a dense area, the densest area in the vicinity is going to be a bedding area, and it's not necessarily a doe or bedding area. Bucks and does will all bed in the same type of area. Yeah. If it's a small bedding area, and there's a buck bedding in it, typically bows does don't want anything to do with mature bucks. You know until they come into heat, so they might avoid it. But uh, typically, if it's a decent sized bedding area, you're gonna have bucks and does bedding in it. Whoever thinks that's not correct doesn't know what they're talking about. Well, I guess what I mean by that is, okay, so if it's a decent sized bedding mm -hmm. area, how do you know where you need to be for the specific buck? Or is that just your hunting access trails that deer seem to be using coming into the bedding area? I mean, how are you setting up in those specific bedding areas? Well, if I'm setting them up, when I'm in their postseason and I'm looking around, typically when I'm setting up a bedding area for rut phase locations, that's typically what I set them up for, you know, because I want to be in the bedding area where the actual breeding and chasing is, is happening during the actual rut. So what I'll look for when I'm in a bedding area is I'll look for the most condensed traffic. You know, look for little openings in bedding areas. Anytime you find an opening in a dense area, it's going to have traffic around the perimeter and probably runways crossing through the center of it. And a lot of times it may have uh, a primary scrape area if it's a little open area because those, because there's a lot of traffic there, bucks put scrapes there. So I'll set up my locations and I'll have them prepped by, again, by the end of April. And then I'll hunt them accordingly. If, you know, I'll go in there, I've killed five bucks. Let me put it in perspective. I've killed five five bucks in the first five days of the season in Michigan. Three of them were in bedding areas. Two were at food food source trees. And the ones I killed in the bedding area, all of all three of those, and these are book bucks I'm talking about, not just bucks, but book bucks. Of the three book bucks I killed, I rattled them all in in a bedding area. What do you have coming up in the, in the next few months? I assume 
uh, late season scouting. It's February. What does, uh, I don't know, the next two or three months look like for you? Yeah, a lot of a lot of scouting. This is my favorite time of year, getting out, and I'm like trying to not fill my travel schedule with, with things really at all. Like this is even podcasts. I, I schedule everything ahead of time so I can have this time of year to really put some boots on the ground and, and changing it up a little bit with last year I went to like all new areas and it made it really difficult. I spread myself too thin. Mm-hmm. And so this year I kind of have it narrowed down to about three different areas that I'm going to focus on. And I'll still have one other ones I'll scout and kind of have as backups, but like I want to really learn a few areas. Um, and, and so that's going to be a little bit of a difference for me. And, uh, but yeah, it's going to be a lot of, a lot of spring scouting. Um, I don't do like much of shed hunting. I just, I, I, I scout. That's what I like to do. And if I pick up a shed, that'd be great. I always call it shed hunting. Like I'm going shed hunting after work, but in reality, one, I'm not, I can't do it because I, <laughs> I try, I'll find an area where like they're feeding and digging and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to do some sweeps through here and I'll do like two. And next thing I know I'm on this Ridge. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I just, uh, you know, kind of move along there. Describe, I guess, without giving away like GPS coordinates, describe the areas that you're, that you're hunting in, in Western PA. Um, so it's, you mean as far as like the, just the terrain, yeah, the and terrain, the, deer density, habitat, yeah. like what does that stuff look like? Yeah. So there's like, so Northern Pennsylvania is, is where I'm located and do most of my hunting. It's, it's pretty, uh, diverse, even though it's all big timber. So there's, it's all, you know, unbroken timber patches, but there's like, there's two different ways I describe it. There's the big woods and then there's like the mountain type hunting and the big woods is more of less terrain, less um, it's not as steep, not as big of um, mountains or hills, but you get more of like the logging cuts and the thickets and and some different um, terrain there. A lot of, you know, creek bottoms coming down through. And then you look at the mountain country and that's more of your big oak ridges and points and terrain and things. So there's like those are the two types of areas that I hunt. And both of them kind of have to be looked at in different perspectives mm-hmm. and how the how the deer use those lands. So that's still, I guess, going back to the physicality side of, um, you know, hunting in the West, like that is pretty much how you're whitetail hunting. I mean, I, I've, I've followed you for a while now and I think, um, you know, we have some similar personalities, similar hunting styles. And for me, that's one of the cool things that I get to watch you do is, you know, take the mental aspect away from it, but going through the physicality of mm-hmm. that kind of hunting style and how you prep what you do in the off season you know, we've talked a little bit on your podcast about what I do with trail cameras, mm-hmm. like in those areas that I'm hunting. What are, I guess, describe some of your um, trail camera strategies, like postseason and, or I guess annually. Um, we'll just break it down into postseason, summer strategies, mm-hmm. and then uh, pre rut, rut, postseason. So, yeah. How does that, what does that look like with trail cameras for you? So, um, I guess postseason, uh, that's probably the, the least that I've used them in the past. Um, but I'm, I'm starting to use them more and more or less what I'm doing is trying to locate them on, I've been putting them on like kind of a lot of points, betting points, um, primary scrapes that are coming out of those betting areas. And I'll just, the reason is I'm not trying to get late season postseason photos. I'm leaving them there for the whole year and mm-hmm. waiting to see what's going to come, you know, in the late summer into the fall. And, a lot of my strategy goes around scrapes and the primary scrapes are the ones that I can use year round, just the, the licking branch itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually I was completely debunked on my theory on this. So I thought putting preorbital gland um, scent on the branch was helpful of that, but I just did a podcast with Carl Miller, who's Dr. Carl Miller. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, Oh, that gland does nothing for um, <laughs> like as for uh, um I guess communication or something. It's more of the forehead gland that's doing it than anything. But really? uh, so I was, I don't know. I, I'm still going to continue to use it because in my head it works. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, but anyways, yeah, a lot of a lot of scrape strategies with with that um, in the the, the postseason. Again, more it's just in travel places and places they're betting. It has really nothing to do with the scrape itself. But those are some of the places I'm leaving it in postseason into the summertime. Some I'm still leaving in those areas. Literally, they'll they'll sit on the same spots, you know, for a whole year. And then there's others in areas that I'm allowed to run minerals. I'll do that to get some velvet photos, um, crick crossings. And as it moves into like late summer, 
as apple trees, some fruit trees, things like that start to go, I'm starting to move into some of those different, you know, food sources. And uh, so that's kind of how the, the late season cameras and then into the, the preseason. What about the – walk us through, as you said, you're – you have your stands preset, so you're not necessarily in going in mobile, but you are having success first time in, you know, harvesting that specific mm-hmm. target deer. When are you going in and making those setups? Is it postseason? Is it in the summer? Is it like they walk us through that process? Yeah, as soon as season's over. Uh, I mean, one thing that I've done for a long time is even before cell phones, I would take a, a pad of a little notepad of paper and a pen and I would put it in a Ziploc bag and it would be in my hunting coat. And I would sit in my tree stands and I would uh, take notes on what I need to do to fine tune this stand location. I'm always trying to take a good stand location and make it a great stand location. So maybe my tree stand's got a squeak that I need to fix in the off season, or maybe I need to trim an extra shooting lane that I didn't notice before, or maybe uh, there's a trail that's just out of range. I need to drop a tree to block that trail to push the deer a little closer to me. So I'm making notes on every stand location and, uh, you know, I may sit in a stand and I notice that, hey, 200 yards over across the field, I need to get a stand over there because I'm seeing a lot of deer movement and a mature buck may be passing through. So I want to take advantage of that. So I've got this notebook full of, of notes and I use a separate page for each stand location. So then in the off season, as soon as season's over, I'm going out to each of those locations. I'm ripping that notepad out or that page out for that particular stand, sticking it in my pocket. I look at what I need to take. Do I need to take a chainsaw? Do I need to take wrenches for the stand or whatever I need to take? And uh, I load up all my gear on my ATV or whatever, and I drive to that stand location, and I get that stand fine-tuned to make it the best it can possibly be. But I do all that starting at the day season ends. Uh, deer hunting never ends for me. There is no season. It's 365 <laughs> days a year. Yeah. And just because I'm not always carrying my bow doesn't mean I'm not deer hunting. Right. So uh, as soon as season ends, and I want to do it before things green up because from the time the woods greens up in the spring, I want to totally stay out of the woods until the day I come back to hunt. So I want my stands ready before that, that green up happens. So there's a couple common things there. You know, with all the people that we've talked to over the past, whatever, nine months, um, one common thing with all the successful guys that we've talked to is being super, super meticulous and paying attention to all those minute very fine details and doing things with purpose as taking notes on specific stand locations, knowing uh-huh. what tools you need to go out to, you know, in, make that stand location better, whether it's maintenance on the stand or moving or whatever. Are you still using the pen and pen and pad or are you well, using actually, the phone now? <laughs> I, I was just thinking to myself as you guys were talking that I actually do that on my iPhone now. <laughs> and I almost pulled my phone out to show you that. I forgot, I forgot this is just a, a, a audio and not a video. But we'll uh, have to get B-roll of that afterwards. Okay. And, and use that. But but yeah, I I do it on my iPhone now. But you know, I'll make a list of what I need to do at this stand location, and then I'll I'll skip down a little bit and I'll make my my list, and uh, then as I go to the stand location, mm-hmm. the, I, I can just look at my phone and make sure I've done everything and check them out and delete yeah. them. Um, by the time deer season ends you know my notes on my on my iphone are so long it takes me forever to scroll down to the bottom because i've made so many notes of what i need to do in the off season that's funny well the other the other common thing i was going to touch on is we just um we just talked to cody DeQuisto, and one of his big things that he does is he's not in there pressuring his properties in the off season as much as everyone wants to be involved and um you know live this 365 days a year it was very pertinent. One of the very pertinent things that he does is stay out of, stay out of, stay out of locations where he know, he knows there's a big deer and he wants to go, may potentially go after a big deer, and not put pressure on those properties. He just stays out, mm-hmm. leaves them alone. Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I don't think most hunters, deer hunters, realize the effect that just a little bit of human intrusion can have on a mature buck. So. Um, you know, I, I do the same thing. When I go into a hunting area, it's with a purpose. Right. I, I go in and, you know, I don't make 10 strips. And that's why I take notes. I don't want to make 10 trips in to, to get a stand right. I want to take everything with me, get it done, get out, stay out. The next day I come back is the day I'm hunting that stand. Mm. 